Good afternoon, guys. All right, so we are getting uh, into the art of the late 1800s or late 19th century. Um, I'm going to be splitting this up into two actual videos for art of the late 1800s. Um, so strap in. Now, the first note packet that you want to look at before we get into any of our actual art is the packet on realism. So realism is the movement in art that will come after Romanticism. So just like Romanticism was a reaction to, to Neoclassicism, Realism is a reaction to the fancifulness and the not realistic qualities of Romantic art. So you're going to have, you know, the Romanticists that, you know, they were concerned with, with nature and with imagining these great things. That's nice and all, but imagination is for dreamers. Realist artists uh, that will start in France and then realism will spread to other places around around the world. Uh, realist artists are focused on showing the world as it is. Uh, one of the most famous artists of this era is named uh, Courbet, and he will say, show me an angel and I will paint one. Essentially meaning that, you know, their angels aren't real. You've never seen one, so why paint one? The, the real world is much more interesting, and one of their focuses one of their fo focuses is going to be on peasants, the working class, the struggle of everyday life, uh, as well as, in some ways, poking fun at the bourgeoisie and the members of the upper classes and the frivolous life that they live. So that's really kind of the core character characteristics of realism uh, rolled up into one. We will also get into photography today, and we will then get into Impressionism. Um, and then we will end in the second video, or we'll start in the second video, looking at post-impressionism, symbolism, and an art movement known as Art Nouveau. And that will really kind of round out uh, the, 18th, the 1800s. So, in your notes, you want to write down what I have here in red, all right? All of these eras are going to be covered in the late uh, 19th century, uh, late 1800s go back there so you want to write that down um, and as we go through we're going to talk a little bit about the background of realistic art um, you know the focus on the, they want to focus on the modern world through personal experience what can they actually see in their life what have they actually seen okay so that's their real goal and realism will be essentially in vogue from the late 1840s until the early 1860s uh, realist art uh, will kind of fall out of vogue because of a certain invention what do you think that invention is? The photo or the uh, the camera and photography. If a photograph can be taken to show the world as it is, why paint the world as it is? And that's kind of where we'll get into the evolution of and movement into imp our impressionism later on. So the Realist Manifesto is to create a living art, um, and they were committed to contemporary social issues, really focusing on the life of the poor, uh, to show that these people deserve to be shown. Their plight deserves to be shown. Okay. Uh, no longer need to really focus on uh, ancient classical uh, gods and goddesses. No need to focus on aristocracy. No need to focus on uh, mythological figures. Uh, they're really inspired, the realist artist, by the genre scenes of Peter Bruegel. He was one of those northern renaissance artists and one of the first western artists to portray peasants um, like he did in his peasant wedding. That's the peasant wedding right there everyday people going about their lives uh, and these lives are important. Uh, this is by another French artist named Millet. Uh, so with Gustave Courbet, he's the artist that you have to know uh, for the realist era. Uh, there's only a couple of people you're going to look at from the realist era. He grows up, moves to Paris, uh, becomes an artist. He is a uh, supporter of the earlier French revolutions. Uh, he becomes the leader of the realist school. And his most famous work that you guys need to know is called The Stonebreakers. And, you know, The Stonebreakers is... A image that he actually saw it's this young man and this old man working as literally stone breakers and they are breaking stones to use those stones for concrete he was outraged and shocked at the time um because you know th these ki these people live these harsh lives that people just disregard people don't care about um and the juxtaposition of a young man and an old man kind of really shows you like what does this young man have to look forward to he will live a harsh life of tattered clothing uh manual labor that will you know 
leave him in poverty forever. Um, you have a younger man whose shirt's torn. Uh, we have this kind of like rural background. We have their meals over here that they will you know take a break and eat with. And when uh, Courbet exhibited this at one of the salons, it outraged the French aristocracy, who were the ones that deemed themselves the judge judges of good paintings. Uh, it broke the rules. And why did it break the rules? You were showing these people unidealized. They are they are not in the epitome of the human form. These are distressed people. We don't even see their faces. Um, and it, it shows the drudgery of kind of common labor. Poverty is emphasized here. The figures were born poor. They're going to remain poor. Uh, it was a reaction to to some of the labor protests that were taking place because of bad working conditions in various French factories. Because at this point in time, the Industrial Revolution is in for in far flung. Um, and Courbet even said, he goes, I stopped to consider two men breaking stones on the highway. It's rare to meet the most complete expression of poverty. So the, so an idea of a picture came to me on the spot. I made an appointment with them at my studio for the next day. On the one side is an old man, 70, and on the other side is a young fellow in his filthy, tattered shirt. Alas, in labor such as this, one's life begins that way and it ends the same. So it's just, just you know, it, it, it's meant to, to make you think and to, to, to have a feeling for these people that live in poverty. That's what it's really all about. Don't just dismiss these people. They're not just, they're not bad people who made bad decisions. It is a life that they can't get out of. There's nowhere else to go. And that's what they're trying to shine light on. So shifting gears now, moving to uh, the New World, we have a realist image of a landscape by Jose Maria Velasco. It's called the Valley of Mexico from the hillside of Santa Isabel from 1882. This is a little bit later because, um, again, it does take time for these movements to, 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 to shift and to, to travel uh, along around the world. This is oil on canvas. It, he was an academic landscaper, which meant that you know he essentially learned how to paint in a in a in, a, in an artistic school, uh, and he really learned how to paint landscapes. He specialized in these kind of broad vistas. Uh, he was a keen observer of nature, so we've got the rocks and the foliage and the clouds and the waterfalls. Uh, he rejected realist landscapes like Courbet and romantic landscapes of Turner. So he, he, he kind of made his own uh, idea of the perfect landscape. He's here in, in Villa Guadalupe overlooking this valley. It's meant to glorify, really, the beauty of the Mexican landscape. And it was inspired by the ideas of German poets uh, with the harmony of what well, they would write about the harmony of humanity and everyday life. So what do we see here? You've got a couple of uh, human figures who are going about their everyday life. You have the town in the, in the background. You have just the overall beauty with it, that he saw in the Mexican landscape. So he's not trying to show poverty in some sad way, but he's also not trying to show the turbulence of nature like, uh, like William uh, Turner did in his English paintings. Now, on to another uh, realist painter named Aye Damie, Damie, sorry. Uh, his, his name looks like Domir, all right, but that's not how it's pronounced. He was a satirist, and he kind of made a lot of realistic cartoons uh, and they, he, that were eventually reprinted in newspapers. So the one that you have to know is Anye Damie. His, it's the Nadir raising photography to the height of art. And Nadir was a photographer. And he took aerial photos from balloons. And he would do that beginning in the 1850s. And here uh, you have Nadir, the man, uh, as this quacky photographer. He's all excited up there to be shooting uh, the images of, of, of the town that he is, that he is taking photographs of. Uh, his hat is even being lost because he's so caught into the moment. Um, and every, bur every building that you see has the word photography on it. And it's mocking the claim that photography can be high art. So the balloon's high up in the air, and, you know, the uh, deer thought that uh, photography was this very sophisticated fine art, but a lot of artists who created art, either oil on canvas or sculpture uh, or etchings and engravings, saw it as easy, and they didn't think it was high art. And there's even a court case in, in, in France uh, where in 1862, where the, the court literally determined that photographs can be considered art and can be submitted uh, to artistic uh, exhibitions. Uh, 
So it originally appeared in a, in a journal named La Boulevard. Uh, it's the the idea that photography can also be intrusive because you're almost having your privacy taken away. If somebody can just come up to you and and take a photo of you, you didn't have a say in it, and they can just take it and run away. And that's kind of why for photograph is kind of. Uh, written on the top of every building it's like there's no uh there's no consent from the person being painted that whether or not they're they consent that to have their 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 image taken and it also kind of foreshadows the idea of modern surveillance photos that you will see kind of come into in, in into history with world war ii world war one vietnam now on to our final painter of the realist era his name is edward Monet. so not monet we're not at monet yet but Edward Monet is kind of seen as the Giotto of the 19th century, all right? And he is seen as just as revolutionary as Giotto was for the way that he creates a realistic setting that challenges uh, what artists believed was allowed to be shown in art. So this is his painting. It's a realist painting uh, named Olympia. And Olympia was a common name for a prostitute. And it was so different than the reclining nudes that we had seen before that looked elegant and looked sophisticated. Uh, even when we looked at um, our last romantic image of the Grand Odalesque, right? So she still was elegant. Yes, she was, you know, manner, had mannerous qualities, had neoclassic qualities, uh, but she looked seductive. Here, it is literally cold. And it's not inviting. Um, she is a young prostitute, very pale skin. Uh, her body is exposed. She's staring out at you, literally saying, are you my next customer? All right, come on in. Let's get done what we got to get done. The bedding is all ruffled up as if, you know, her last customer had just left. Uh, she's got a black maidservant. She also has a black cat. You know, black cats are considered bad luck. We have these dramatic contrasts in colors. And it's just th this jarring realism of what prostitution really was and what all you know throughout art history what these reclining nudes were you know these reclining nudes were always meant to be uh beautiful and thoughtful and you know what you would think of even as as, as sexy this this is not this is very, very, very much in your face. This is sex, it's a job, bam, that's it, okay? And that was jarring for people to see because you could see nudity in art, but it was meant to be highbrow. This is considered lowbrow. And uh, her servant is bringing over to her flowers that one of her uh, customers has just sent over, all right? So that that's what's happening here. And it was very, very, very uh, striking. And we're used to that Venus of Urbino by Titian down below. Uh, where it's the goddess Venus, the goddess of love. You know, it's okay to show that type of nudity, but to show a commoner and name it uh, a common prostitute name, Scandalo. So let's continue. So you do, again, want to hit pause here, write down what I have in red. Uh, we've already kind of talked about all of this. Uh, you know, there's a simplified modeling to this. There's active brush strokes. We can kind of see the movement of the brush strokes, especially in the folds of the uh, the bedding and in the uh, clothing of the maidservant. So now on the photography. So we looked at, in the Romantic era, the daguerreotypes. They were some of the earliest styles of photos. But now we're going to see our photography become... Uh, artistic so in the 19th century you know you could record an object exactly as it was at a particular moment and that is going to essentially you know leave artists like ong and corbet who were realists they they don't have to worry about making realistic art because you can just take a picture of it so we've seen the use of early camera like objects like the camera obscura uh be used by vermeer which reflected the image back into a into, into a box through the use of a mirror um, and with photography, you know, a picture is worth a thousand words, and it's relatively easy to reproduce. Uh, the very first photograph was in 1826. The very first human ever photograph was in 1839. Uh, people began to visit studios to have their image captured in daguerreotypes, the early photograph, uh, for photograph and camera that Daguerre had invented. Again, all this is happening in, in France. Uh, earlier or early photographs uh, that you often saw that were considered artistic were travel photography. Here we have uh, a Native American, it almost looks like Mesa Verde here, cliff dwellings. We have wartime photography. We have uh, photography that is used in for in a large on a large scale for the coal or the Civil War. 
you have photography that is used to also bring the plight of children and the industrial revolution and poverty to the masses so these could be reproduced inside of magazines to many people this was much more had much more of an impact than seeing a painting did you also have photography being used for fashion and it's still today used for all of these purposes travel uh uh, for war, for fashion, for poverty, all of for, all of these these modes of using photography for art are still being used today. Again, more fashion photography here. And then the one that you do have to know is called "The Horse Galloping" by Edward Moybridge. So, it is photography at this point has now in the late 1800s because this is 1878, and the very first ca uh, photograph was taken in 1829. Uh, photography is advanced enough that it could capture moments that the human eye could not see. So when a horse gallops, uh, when a horse gallops, what you have here is, you know, oftentimes the the legs and the movement of the legs are completely, um, you can't see them because the horse is moving so quickly. Here, uh, what he will use is something called a zoopraxiscope, and it, it takes flash photography at a high rate, and you can see the actual movement of the horse's legs as it is galloping very quickly. And it bridges between still photography, and also this is going to take us down the road to then the creation of motion pictures, all right? Being able to use photography at that high rate of capturing movement uh, will allow movies the movie camera, the motion picture camera, to be created. Now, photography is going to have an incredible influence on Impressionism because Impressionist artists are going to say, why do I need to create something that looks real if I could just take a photograph of it? So they are going to bend what is acceptable in art when they go to create their version of art, which is Impressionism. So Impressionism is a period of time in France, really specifically, uh, and specifically Paris, where art will be created in this era and it will be in vogue and it will be seen as uh, avant-garde, which means on the cutting edge, from 1872 until the 1880s. Now, you do. this is a long slide, but you do want to write these down. And I do have a note packet attached that you'll want to read to uh, before you continue into this section. So Impressionist art are continuing revolutionary changes that were set in motion by the Romantic artists and the Realist artists. They are seen uh, as really contributing, too, to the modern art movement of the 1800s. Again, the avant-garde, changing what is acceptable and pushing the boundaries of what's acceptable. So in Impressionist art, you're going to have artists using quick and fleeting brushstrokes. They're, they're trying to capture the dappling effects of light and how light hits something at any given moment. Um, and how it hits something or makes an impression on something or the impression of light on a surface. And these artists are going to be using uh, tubed paint so that they can go outside and paint the same object at different times of the day, at different times of the year, because they're really focused on capturing the fleeting moment as if you looked at something and then you looked away very quickly. You have, a, you have an impression in your mind of what that, that image looked like, but you don't have it 100%. You don't have it clear. And then they also want to add the, uh, the lighting techniques of the way that light played on the image as well. So these artists wor w uh, worked in plain air, it was called, which is working outside, which allowed them to have this spectacular color range. They were you know, not just limited to black paint. Uh, they, they, they could use any color. They kind of cropped they also use cropped edges, unusual angles. Uh, Parisian life provided inspiration to some of them, and they're also going to be really influenced by Japanese art, and we'll talk about that in a minute as well. So they're influenced by Japanese art because in 1850, the country of Japan was forced to open up by the United States. So the United States forces Japan to trade with the rest of the world, and that is going to uh, create an influx of Japanese uh, art in Europe, and you are going to have woodblock prints like the Great Wave uh, that show nature and show a moment in time. That's really going to affect these artists, and that that this rush of Japanese culture into Europe is called Japisame, all right, Japisame, and it's the influx of Japanese culture, like the Great Wave. So the idea of capturing that one moment, the strength of nature here, about to come down over these rowers, Mount Fuji in the background, all right, that will highly influence. And if you go to Monet's house today in Giverney in France, which is a little bit outside of Paris, his house is covered with these woodblock prints. That is what inspired him. 
So who do you have to know? The number one uh, main man that you have to know is Claude Monet. He is the father of Impressionist. I mean, and the name Impressionism actually comes from one of his paintings called Impression Sunrise. That's where the whole movement gets its name. Um, he uses choppy brushstrokes, vertical lines um, on the horizon, which you know academics considered, uh, and many academics considered his paintings to be unfinished because the brushstrokes didn't look fully blended. That was like ab absurd to have unfinished brushstrokes on a painting he will paint mostly outdoor settings a lot of landscapes and seascapes he'll play he'll paint a lot of buildings at different times of the day to get the lighting and the shadowing that takes place now the piece that you have to know is called the saint lazary train station you kind of have this mixture of industrial life the industrial revolution interior setting because it's a train station exterior because you can still see the cityscape on the outside so he is famous for painting a series of paintings of the same subjects at different times of the day uh and different days of the year all to get the ideas of light and color you see the effects of the steam the light and color all right it's not really about the machine or the travelers it's really about lighting all right where is it darker where is it lighter at you have subtle graduations of light or graduations of light um, on the various surfaces uh darker for uh some of the steam darker for the smoke coming out of the smokestack the forms themselves you can't really get a whole clear fixture of of the train and the people and the buildings they kind of dematerialize and cover color is the overwhelming feature of each of the forms uh, this is one of his images of the Rhone Cathedral that he painted. And again, he did it during different times of the year. Uh, here you've got different times of the day. You've got dusk. You've got sunset. He did his water lilies as well. This was at his uh, home in Giverney. He did uh, Woman with the Parasol. It's actually his wife and his son. Mr. Martyr and myself saw that a couple of years ago in Washington, D.C. He did his Japanese footbridge, which is also in his gardens as well. And then the final Impressionist artist that you have to know is a female. And it's a female American who actually goes and lives in Paris uh, and works with a lot of these Impressionist artists. She actually is really good friends with Degas. And she, though, because being a woman, uh, she wasn't really allowed to go and paint the same subject matter as the men you know it wasn't safe for a woman just to go take her paints and go outside so she paints a lot of interior settings of women and children um, and shows a woman's world but from an impressionist perspective so Casas' world is filled with women women are independent not needing men to compete them or to complete themselves women here enjoy the company um, of other women often uh, they're not posing or acting the figures possess this natural charm uh, she has kind of here she's influenced by Japanese art as well because of the Japanese hairstyle the point of view many Japanese images are created from this uh, kind of rear but to the side view and then with a mirror being used we have the tenderness uh, of this scene of a woman just quietly getting changed either getting into the bath or about to get out of the bath it was part this one of a series of of 10 prints that all came together of various aspects of a woman's life and you have this contrasting sensuous curves of her body with the straight lines of her furniture and of the wall so the softness of a woman and the harshness of the real world and then we also have the uh, pastel color scheme all right, and that's going to be it for this video. In our next video, we are getting into post-impressionism, art nouveau, and symbolism, and some uh, sculpture and architecture. See you guys then.